I'd like to welcome you to uh, that second day of conception of empirical success. Uh, happens to be in honor of Bill Harper. This Sunday day is going to end with a party at Bill's house, to which he wants me to emphasize you're all invited. Uh, there's a map on the back of the program. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here because I'm a big fan of Bill. I know I'm not alone in this because so many people traveled here on Thursday from southeastern Michigan, a single car couldn't contain them. One of those travelers is Alan Gibber, today's first speaker. The Richard D. Brandt, distinguished professor, University Professor of Philosophy, at the University of Michigan. Um, his title is uh, Alien Probability. Well, thank you very much. I'm uh, honored and delighted to be here to uh, give Bill uh, some inadequate token of recognition. So, um, I'm going to talk about, uh, I kept changing the title, but what I'm going to be talking about is, uh, is a couple of kinds of epistemic expressivism. Uh, so, the idea of expressivism is that we can elucidate certain meanings by saying what states of mind they express. So, I think of Ayer's view that uh, moral statements express approval or disapproval as setting the model, although I'll be elaborating on what Ayer thought was possible. Um, so his emotivism had it that stealing is wrong is an expression of disapproval of stealing. Uh, now, epistemic expressivism, as the term is used, uh, really covers two separate subjects. Uh, one is uh, epistemic modals and the like. Uh, my view is that these are expressive of partial credence. So uh, if I say it might rain, I'm expressing a state of having non-negligible credence in rain. And uh, this is the view that uh, Seth Yeltsin has uh, developed to a, a, an admirable degree, and uh, Eric Swanson has uh, views that uh, are Similar, although I don't have it uh, straight yet, uh, which things of his I am repeating, which things I disagree with, and which things he hasn't pronounced on. Um, but I want to contrast this with uh, a certain kind of probability statement, uh, a kind that I think uh, concerns uh, warrant for credence, or what, uh, what degree of credence is justified. And the idea of the expressivism for warrant is that uh, the word warrant is used to express uh, acceptance of norms, or more complexly, uh, uh, restrictions on states that involve the acceptance of norms. Uh, so some main points that I'm going to be making are these. Uh, that uh, at least two different uh, deflationary conceptions of truth apply in these two domains. Uh, one I'm going to be calling bare deflationary truth, and the other I'm going to be calling full deflationary truth. Uh, uh, I'm going to suggest, and I think this accords with uh, Seth Yeltsin, that uh, assertions propose states of mind uh, to share. Uh, and these states of mind are only sometimes a uh, full leaf in propositions. Uh, if I had time, which I don't think I will, I would also talk about the idea that claims about meaning are themselves normative, so that the claims that I'm making are normative claims. The claims about meaning concern warrant for states of mind, uh, where once again, warrant is understood expressivistically in terms of states of mind expressed. Uh, so epistemic expressivism has two senses. Uh, once, in one sense, it's a theory of concepts in normative epistemology. Uh, so concepts like uh, that of warrant for belief, uh, reason to believe, uh, epistemic justification. So um, the other, uh, uh, well, I, 
I want to give a, an expressivistic treatment of these terms and concepts. Uh, in my version, uh, terms like uh, warrant, uh, reason, uh, justification, uh, express aspects of plans for creedal states and a special sense of plan that I'll be saying more about. And on the other hand, uh, epistemic expressivism can be the theory of epistemic modals and the like. Uh, so examples would be uh, maybe it will rain, probably it will rain, surely it will rain, uh, it might rain. Uh, and these, I'll be saying, express aspects of one's uh, credences in, the, in David Lewis's sense of degrees of belief or credence or subjective probabilities. So let me talk a little bit about uh, Warren for creedal states on this uh, on this view. Uh, by the way, I'll uh, I'm pretty much laying out a set of views, some of which are more or less standard and widespread, and some of which aren't. Uh, occasionally, I'll uh, argue in a desultory way for uh, things that I say, but mostly this is trying to paint a possible picture. Okay, so, uh, so I want to say that we can apply this expressivistic approach to theory of meaning to uh, creedal states like having uh, at least a non-negligible degree of of belief, and also that we can apply it to um, probability statements understood as normative statements. So let me say something about uh, warrant for creedal states, normative claims uh, about what I'm calling probability. So um, suppose I talk about the probability of rain given, say, by total evidence, and I say that it's uh, 0.6. Well, that means, uh, according to the UL layout, that uh, uh, credence of 0.6 in rain today uh, would be warranted given my total body of evidence. But what does warranted mean here? And I say that uh, this means the same thing as you could express with a conditional imperative. Uh, if body of evidence E is one's total evidence, say, if uh, one has my actual total evidence, uh, then uh, imperative uh, accord rain credence 0.6. So I'm taking credence to be a psychic state, something that uh, is the subject matter of a naturalistic uh, uh, psychology, uh, but the psychology I'm talking about is uh, is speculative. I take it to be the kind of uh, psychic state explained by classical decision theory, by Ramsey, Savage, uh, I think maybe the best version is Hammond's, uh, as uh, something involving dispositions. Uh, and then I want to say that the uh, imperative, uh, if he is one's total evidence, of course, uh, Rain, credence, 0.6, uh, expresses a state of what I'm going to be calling planning. Um, okay, so uh, let me talk about expressing a state of planning. And the imperative that I wanted to explain was uh, in its general form, if E is what's total evidence, accord A, a credence uh, X. And I'm saying that this uh, expresses a state of what I'm calling planning, uh, planning to give uh, the statement uh, credence x uh, for the case where E is one's total evidence. Uh, and to have such a credence uh, in brain, say, is for one's dispositions to action to be constrained in a certain way, as I say, is as explained by classical decision theory. So roughly um, half credence <coughs> in A disposes one to bet indifferently for or against A. Uh, okay. 
So this involves the idea of expressing a state of mind. Um, so we have to contrast expressing a state of mind and saying that I'm in that state of mind, a contrast that Ayer uh, made. Um, so suppose I say I have a house in Ann Arbor. Well, that's expressing a state of mind of mine namely my belief that I have a house in Ann Arbor. And of course, the statement is true. Uh, in case I do have a house in Ann Arbor. Uh, but crucially, we can talk also about its sincerity condition. It's, my statement is sincere if I believe that I have a house in Ann Arbor, even if I'm mistaken that it's burned down uh, uh, without my knowledge. Uh, and then, if I say to you, I have a house at Ann Arbor, uh, you agree if you believe that I have a house at Ann Arbor. Um, and this contrasts with my stating that I have that belief, I state that I have that belief by saying, I believe I have a house at Ann Arbor. Um, and that states that I have the belief as opposed to expressing the belief. So. Uh, that statement is true, just in case I uh, do have this belief, uh, regardless of whether it's whether the belief is true. And you agree with my statement if you believe that I believe that I have the house. Uh, so expressing a state of mind and what state of mind is expressed are characterized by sincerity conditions and agreement conditions. So, um, what can I say about the obvious subject of expressing evil states like um, having non negligible credence in rain? Uh, so, as I say, this roughly fits us, at least roughly fits us, uh, Seth Yeltsin's people expressivism and Eric Swanson's constraint semantics. Uh, I say, for example, perhaps it will rain today. Uh, I thereby express uh, having some credence uh, and rain today in the sense of uh, not negligible credence. Uh, you agree if you too have some not negligible credence in rain today. And uh, saying uh, perhaps it will rain today differs from saying I have substantial credence in rain today. That's the difference between expressing having substantial credence in rain today and uh, saying that I have substantial credence in rain today. Uh, so in the case of uh, saying that I have the belief, uh, to agree is to believe that I have that credence, not to share the credence. So uh, as I say, uh, expressing a state of mind is characterized by uh, sincerity conditions and agreement conditions. Uh, I was using perhaps it will rain, which expresses having non negligible credence in rain. The sincerity condition is that it's sincere. Uh, when I say it, if it only if I have non negligible credence in rain, and then the agreement condition, you, my audience, agree, if, but only if you too have some non negligible credence in rain. And you could disagree by saying, uh, no, surely it won't. Uh, and that would reject having non negligible credence in rain. Uh, so let me you give another case of uh, freedom expressionism. Suppose I say, uh, likely as not, it'll rain. Uh, so this expresses having credence. Uh, one half, roughly one half, in rain. That has a sincerity condition that's sincere only if uh, I have credence one half in rain. Uh, it has an agreement condition, you agree, uh, if only if you two have credence one half in rain. And you can express uh, disagreement. You can say, no, not likely as not. Uh, you could add. Uh, more likely than not, it will rain. Or you could add, uh, more likely than not, it won't rain. Uh, so
So I'm claiming that there's a kind of state straight disagreement uh, expressible with uh, no, not likely as not. And let me give another case. Uh, uh, suppose I say it's almost sure to rain. Uh, this expresses having high credence in rain. That's a necessary condition that it's sincere. If only if the speaker has high credence in rain. And the agreement condition, the audience agrees. If it only if the audience has high credence in rain. Uh, and again, uh, the audience could express disagreement. Uh, no, it might well not rain. No, it might well not rain. Uh, and that expresses having <laughs> less than high credence in rain. Uh, another controversial case, but a case uh, in my view, is indicative and conditional. Suppose I left a book out on my back deck and just realized that I left it there and I don't know whether it's rained. I could say, if it rained, the book is ruined. Uh, and that, I say, expresses high conditional credence in the books being ruined, given that it rained. Uh, this has a sincerity condition having high conditional credence in ruin, given, given rain. And an agreement condition, you'll agree with me, if you have high condi conditional credence in that the book is ruined, given that it rained. Uh, and you can express disagreement, you can say, no, even if it rained, perhaps the book isn't ruined. And that expresses having um, conditional credence in the books being ruined, given that it rained, uh, that's not negligibly um, less than one. Now, I've been talking about uh, expressing states of mind. Uh, but I think we can emulate Stallnacker with modifications and talk about expression as shaping a kind of common ground in conversation. Uh, so I'll speak of disagreement in an aspect of credence, like uh, having uh, high credence in uh, it's being ruined given that it rained, uh, and try to modify Stallnacker's picture of common ground. So Stallnacker's common ground, I forget its exact uh, terminology, but it consists of propositions taken as believed in common. Uh, but we can let the common ground then uh, consist in attitudes taken as shared in common. Uh, so belief in a proposition will be a special case of uh, an attitude taken as shared in common. But uh, another case could perfectly well be being against stealing. Uh, that would be the way to elaborate Ayer's theory of uh, the meaning of stealing is wrong. Uh, or uh, having at least not negligible credence in rain, or having at least not negligible credence in, in the books being ruined given that it rained. So uh, this picture, uh, just emulating Stolmacher, we could say that uh, uh, assertions uh, uh, shape the common ground. So we could say they not only express states of mind, but they put forth candidates for addition to the common ground. Uh, and uh, others in the conversation can reject the proposed addition. So the word no, I take it as a sign of Rejection. I don't know if it's uh, if I can say that it's invariably uh, in the most straightforward use of uh, um, an expression of rejection of what's been of uh, the state of mind that's been expressed. But uh, in many cases, at least it is. Uh, and barring some sort of dissent, uh, um, the attitude now gets presupposed as shared, whether it's belief, full belief in a proposition, or partial belief, or disapproval, or various other things. Uh, so
So I'm saying that expressing, say, conditional credence is different from claiming warrant for it. Uh, but we have to ask, what's the difference? Uh, well, what's the difference, uh, for instance, between perhaps it will rain and non-negligible credence in rain is warrant, which is uh, how I want to regiment the, uh, the claim. Uh, the probability of rain is non-negligible. Uh, after all, the two are assertable in roughly the same cases, uh, but I want to say that uh, talk about uh, probability as I'm using the term about uh, what uh, sort of credence and rain is warranted has to be relative to a body of evidence, whereas uh, things like perhaps are not relative to a body of evidence. They work in a different way. Um, and it's, um, claims about uh, what degree of credence is warranted are, uh, are relative to a body of evidence, at least implicitly. Uh, so we could fill out uh, non negligible credence and rain is warranted, uh, perhaps by saying uh, uh, non negligible credence and rain is warranted by my evidence. And you could agree with that. You could say, yes, it is. Uh, but you haven't seen the new forecast. Uh, it probably won't rain after all. So in that case, you're agreeing. Uh, you're uh, letting uh, non, you're letting belief in uh, some credence of rain is, some credence in rain is warranted by my evidence into the common ground, but uh, you aren't, uh, you aren't letting perhaps it will rain into the common ground because uh, you've said, uh, well, here I'm using probably not in the normative sense, but in the creedal expressive sense, and I don't think there's a sharp distinction between when we're using it in the two different senses. Uh, but uh, anyway, the, if you express uh, uh, having uh, less than uh, full credence, uh, less than high credence in rain, uh, you aren't thereby disagreeing with uh, non negligible, or if you uh, express uh, disagreement with uh, saying that uh, non negligible credence in rain is warranted by my evidence. Uh, you aren't necessarily, uh, um, you may still dissent from um, having such credence. So, um, to, um, to, it may rain, you say, no, surely it won't, and that disagrees with it may rain, um, it doesn't disagree with uh, rain uh, with uh, substantial credence in rain is warranted by my evidence. Uh, okay, now I want to talk about uh, truth, and this will be kinds of deflationary truth that we can understand in terms of agreement. Um, so when we have I mean, there's a question of what constitutes agreement or disagreement. I want to take that as a, a fairly uh, primitive feature of, uh, of psychology and, uh, and conversation stance. Uh, and when we have agreement and disagreement, even if it's a disagreement in attitude, uh, as Stevenson <coughs> talked about in the case of uh, stealing is wrong, uh, we have the first steps toward uh, step toward uh, an expressivistic concept of truth. So expressivism, as I say, uh, is the view that <coughs> strategy to explain a concept. We explain what it is to believe uh, a thought uh, that involves that concept uh, true or false. Uh, and in that formulation, the meaning of true and true and false at the end are 
explain trivially by just saying that the word serves to express uh, uh, the belief that the thought is true as uh, any uh, expression of a thought uh, expresses the uh, expresses belief in that thought. Uh, but then the crucial step in saying that in being an expressivist about truth is to say that to believe uh, a thought true is to agree with it and uh, taking agreement as primitive rather than um, um, rather than the word true or the concept true is primitive. Um, so expressivism uh, requires a state of mind that a word is used to express. So Jamie Dreyer has the example of, uh, of uh, say, Heidel Bob as a way of accosting Bob, and asks if we could change this to Bob is Heidel, and uh, thus say that we've given a meaning for, uh, for uh, a statement, Bob is Heidel. Uh, doesn't work for accosting clearly, but that's because uh, there isn't a state of mind that Hayo, in his example, is used to express. Uh, and then the state of mind has to be uh, one that's subject to agreement or disagreement from other perspectives. So, say, uh, having an itch would not be uh, uh, subject to uh, this kind of expressivistic treatment uh, because there's no such thing as agreeing or disagreeing. There's no such thing as you're agreeing or disagreeing with my itch. Um, so when we talk about agreement conditions for a sentence uh, S, like uh, um, if Bill Rain, um, or suppose we talk about uh, Stealing is wrong, um, or in the sense of something being warranted. Uh, we're not uh, we're not trying to start with the notion of a truth condition, a set of possible worlds in which uh, in which uh, say if my brain would be true, where with possible worlds taken as maximally specific ways things might have been, or as the set of centered worlds from which it's true, maximally specific standpoint, possible standpoints one might occupy. We're not starting uh, that way. We're starting with uh, an agreement condition. Uh, but this is going to be for what I'm calling full truth, the kind of truth that normative claims have on this expressivistic treatment, but uh, perhaps claims and indicative if-then claims don't have. So, uh, so an agreement condition will be a set of maximally decided states one might be in. Uh, picturesquely, we can treat each such state as belief in a complete uh, in a complete world, but the worlds here are uh, virtual in the sense that uh, this talk about belief in a world stems from talk about uh, or, uh, or basic things of the explanation, like uh, the way things are naturalistically, um, um, and what's a psychological state not expressed as belief in such and such, but explained, say, as approval or partial treatments or something like that. Um, so um, I, I argued in both my books, so uh, Wise Choices and Feelings in 1990, and, uh, and Thinking How to Live in 2003, that a set of possible worlds, uh, in the case of uh, straight, prosaically factual belief, a set of possible worlds corresponds to a set of maximally decided states uh, with sort of paradigm beliefs we could start from either direction uh, if we start analysis in terms of sets of maximally decided states, then we can uh, analyze a, a larger range of things without believing in strangely non-natural states of affairs. Um, so can 
I say about uh, expressive truth? Well, to say uh, the thought he voiced is true is to express agreement with the thought we can start saying, and to believe that the thought he voiced with that statement is true is to agree with the uh, thought one takes and to have expressed. Uh, but this isn't enough to yield agreement conditions in the sense of uh, sense of decided states. Uh, and the example I've given is indicative conditionals. Uh, so I've been saying that uh, I believe that if, uh, if Stallacker came he's hiding, uh, just in case my conditional credence on he's hiding, uh, given that he came, is roughly equal to one. That's the Ramsey Adams view. Uh, but uh, uh, there's, I've argued, and I'll say a bit about this, there's no set of decided beliefs on all non-conditional matters that constitutes this condition wholly. Uh, so we should distinguish, as I've said, grades of truth. Well, first, uh, in my 1990 book, I thought that there was a kind of robust truth that, uh, that normative claims didn't have. Uh, now I think nobody really knows what robust truth is, and so I won't be using that notion. But there's the kind of bare deflationary truth that applies, for example, to the epistemic might, to perhaps, to uh, epistemic if-then statements. Um, so here we just say that to hold true is to agree, to hold false is to disagree. That's a kind of expressivistic explanation of the notion. And as I say, for this, the statement must express a state of mind by disapproval or substantial credence. And it must be a state of mind that is subject to disagreement from various standpoints. And then what I'm calling full of deflationary truth um, has this bare deflationary truth, but plus what I'm calling agreement conditions uh, that any decided state of mind would constitute either agreement or disagreement. So uh, the contrast is uh, between perhaps statements and epistemic conditionals and so forth that don't have agreement conditions. Although one can agree or disagree, it's just that one can uh, agree or disagree in every decided state, uh, maybe in some decided states, but uh, not in others. Uh, and Hence, these have only what I call a bare deflationary truth. And then uh, moral statements are an example of things that do have agreement conditions, even on Ayer's emotivistic account, where there are expressions of approval or disapproval. Uh, because in a decided state, one's decided in one's approvals and disapprovals and holdings of approval and so forth. Uh, uh, so in a decided state, one agrees or uh, or disagrees with uh, disapproval. Uh, so wrong descriptions even on Ayer's emotivistic account, which is the one I accept exactly, uh, uh, have what I'm calling full deflationary truth. So uh, take the usual case, uh, say a disjunction, uh, P or Q, where P might be a rain, Q would be a snowed, uh, and one agrees in either three states that are fully decided on whether it rained and whether it snowed. Uh, I can, I agree if I uh, believe it rained and disbelieve it snowed. If I believe both, uh, it rained and it snowed, and, uh, and if I disbelieve that it rains and believe that it snowed, and I disagree in the other uh, state decided on those two matters, uh, if I uh, disbelieve that it rains and disbelieve that it snowed. Uh, so uh, in any maximally opinionated state concerning whether it rained or whether it snowed, 
uh, one agrees or disagrees with uh, it, the inclusive uh, it rained or it snowed. So in the case of moralities, I've been saying Ayer says stealing is wrong means who for stealing, not his words, but I think uh, an accurate uh, rendition of his view, uh, where this who for stealing expresses disapproval of stealing, and this has an agreement condition as a set of maximally decided states. Uh, it's uh, a maximally decided state is maximally decided, uh, fully decided on matters of not moral fact or not normative fact, and uh, also fully decided in one's approval, disapproval, or neutrality toward any possible act. Uh, and as I say, this gives what we might call virtual possible worlds. Uh, so for example would be the virtual world where John <laughs> stole and stealing is wrong to believe in this world. Uh, we explain these virtual worlds just by explaining believing in them. To believe in it is to believe that John stole and to disapprove of stealing. I'm belaboring this partly because uh, Jason Stanley keeps complaining that I haven't explained why uh, uh, I can hold that uh, uh, the moral claims on my view are uh, true or false in a sense in which uh, indicative conditionals are not true or false. So with epistemic conditionals, again, they have no agreement or disagreement conditions. Uh, if one's certain that the antecedent is false, then one neither agrees nor disagrees, in my view. Uh, and that was what I tried to uh, uh, tried to argue with my uh, slide peat example a long time ago. So Pete's henchman, Jack and Zach, may agree on th how things almost surely are, uh, namely that Pete didn't call and would have lost if he had, uh, but they can accept uh, incompatible conditionals. Uh, Jack, if Pete called, he won. I, I guess Jack, Zach, if Pete called, he lost. Uh, and uh, this happens in the case I just described, where, uh, so long as what they know for sure is, in Jack's case, that Pete wouldn't have called unless he had a winning hand. Um, so if he called, he won. And in Zach's case, what he knows for sure is that he had a losing hand. So if Pete called, he lost. Um, so I'm claiming that uh, other cases of bare deflationary truth include that Stephen Hodel's and the like, uh, maybe statements, probably statements understood as uh, act like maybe, surely, just possibly. Uh, so to believe that perhaps it will rain, I keep saying, is to give some non negligible credence to its raining. Uh, and no state that constitutes agreeing with this is decided on whether or not it will rain. Uh, there is, I agree, a state of mind that constitutes agreeing with this, namely a uh, state of having non-negligible credence in rain, but this state has decided on whether it will rain. Uh, okay, so that's uh, using the example of, uh, of uh, epistemic modals like uh, might and Works that function in a similar way. Uh, turn back to epistemic warrant. I can say belief in natural selection wouldn't have been warranted for Hume. Uh, and the express mystic proposal is saying that this expresses a plan of mine in an extended sense of plan. Plan uh, not to believe, given Hume's evidence in natural selection. Uh, and uh, this statement, the uh, belief in natural selection wouldn't have been warranted for Hume, uh, has uh, full deflationary truth value. Uh, one agrees or disagrees if one has 
fully decided plans for credences given any epistemic circumstance and fully decided beliefs as to Hume's epistemic circumstance and unlimited calculating power exponents. Um, as I say, I'm using the word plan in a uh, special sense. It's uh, uh, the one I used, I called the state I called accepting a norm in my 1990 book. Uh, these are contingency plans that may be for really wild contingencies like being Caesar and the Rubicon. Uh, I allow plans for states where we wouldn't normally speak of plans like uh, having non negative credence. Uh, uh, planning to admire somebody for what she did. Um, so, for instance, to use the example I used, a binge alcoholic might plan in the sense for abstinence um, um, for a situation where he knows that, uh, in fact, he's going to drink. Uh, so it isn't part of having a plan for a contingency that one believes that one's present thinking uh, would affect what one did in that contingency. Uh, but I want to say plans do uh, tend toward the state plan. Uh, we might have a worry about this. We might say, well, uh, plans, uh, we can't plan for belief because, even in this extended sense, because we don't believe it will, uh, we can't, I might uh, plan whether or not to believe in dinosaurs, given Hume's evidence, uh, but I can't acquire a credence in dinosaurs at will, so how can I have plans for uh, a degree of credence given Hume's evidence, even if I know what Hume's evidence was? Uh, but I want to characterize planning as a state of mind that tends in a characteristic way to cause the state of mind one plans for, not by causing one to will to be in that state, at least not in all cases. Uh, and indeed, even with plans for action, uh, we have a light pattern after all. Having planned for what to do, uh, if I have a plan for what to do right now, that tends to cause me to will the act. So if I have a plan for right now to take a sip of water, that causes me, tends to cause me to uh, will uh, to take a sip of water. Um, that is a matter of, we might say, having an immediate intention or volition. Uh, but uh, just as one doesn't will to believe, one doesn't will to will. So uh, I don't will by willing to will. Uh, so I'm not willing at will, and what the plan, what having the plan eventuates most directly in is my uh, willing to take the sip of water at that time. Uh, so acting at will consists in willingly act, but not just in that, because uh, I might suddenly be paralyzed unbeknownst to me. Uh, so it involves willingly act along with unconscious mechanisms that uh, produce the will movement. I'm calling this influence, or in Weistrich's staff feeling, I call this influence normative governance. Um, so this is the way that planning in this sense to be right now in a uh, state of mind uh, uh, view that might be a creedal state, might be a state of approval, tends to break about that one is in the state. Uh, so examples are planning to admire, planning to believe, planning to act in a certain way. Um, and um, um, and um, planning to act tends toward um, willing the act in the same way that planning to admire tends toward admiring, and planning to leave uh, tends toward leaving. Um, my speculation is that uh, 
planning in the special sense is a psychological natural kind. And the theory of meaning, uh, conditional on that uh, speculation being right, is that normative descriptions express states of planning in this sense. So let me summarize what I've been saying about truths for uh, creedal claims. Statements of probability have full deflationary agreement conditions. They concern warrant for credence. That's with respect to a body of evidence. And uh, with if the audience has decided plans and beliefs, the audience agrees or disagrees. Uh, and hence, uh, these have agreement conditions, which uh, give rise to a kind of uh, virtual truth condition, so to speak. Um, whereas epistemic modals, uh, epistemic conditionals, and the like have only their deflationary truth. We can say that's true to agree, but as to the United states, at least in some cases, we neither agree nor disagree. I want to say a word now about uh, claims that I have reason to believe something. I think we can uh, analyze this as, uh, as normative in the same way. So the concept of reason to believe something, uh, I'll say it's a matter of uh, having reason to believe A as opposed to B. B might be not A or it might be something else. Uh, and we should be able to talk about the strength of the uh, epistemic reason. Um, um, so we want to say what it is to believe uh, this kind of uh, a statement in this kind of form. Consideration C is reason of strength sigma to believe A as opposed to B. Um, so I'll take an example. Uh, Suppose Jill knows that an urn was chosen by a coin flip uh, from two urns. One, or, one of the urns was two-thirds white and one-third red. Uh, the other was one-third white and two-thirds red. Uh, uh, Jill knows nothing else. Uh, okay. And then the, she observes that the first ball drawn is red. Uh, this is reason to believe that the urn is two-thirds red. Uh, and we can talk about how strong a reason it is. So the expressivistic loss, I'll say, is that we can understand the claim that it's reason to believe as, uh, as equivalent to the imperative. Uh, weigh the observation you've made toward believing that the urn is two-thirds red. Uh, and this imperative expresses uh, planning sense uh, to weigh the observation in that way. Uh, well, that requires talking about epistemic weighing. And I don't know how wide a range of cases this applies to, but I'll be following uh, a member of I.J. Good. Uh, if one uh, conditionalizes on the new evidence, uh, one uh, multiplies one's um, one multiplies one's odds of it's predominantly red to it's predominantly white. So she starts out with, um, with odds of one to one. One multiplies this by the ratio of the likelihoods, which in this case doubles um, the odds. They now become two to one. Uh, so we uh, multiply this one to one um, uh, odds by uh, the ratio of uh, uh, one's credence in predominantly red, given the first ball drawn was red, uh, to uh, uh, it's predominantly white, given the first ball drawn was red, and, that's, uh, and that ratio is 2 to 1. Uh, so we can say the weight one accords to uh, that evidence as favoring belief in predominantly red as opposed to predominantly white. We could let it be any sort of log of this ratio, say, for simplicity in this case, the log to base 2. Uh, so 
when I say that uh, the balls being, the first balls being drawn being red is reason of strength one to believe in predominantly red as opposed to predominantly white. That means uh, give that evidence weight uh, one in favor of believing predominantly red as opposed to predominantly white. Uh, and this expresses a plan, so the way the evidence where we've described uh, weighing the evidence in terms of uh, in naturalistic terms, in terms of dispositions as explained by uh, classical theory, decision theory uh, interpreted uh, as uh, specifying the shapes of, uh, of dispositions. So, uh, I've been applying expressivistic ideas to uh, creedal claims into two subjects. Uh, one is creedal statements with perhaps uh, indicative if then and the like, and the other is normative claims of probability. And I've been saying that these contrast in the fullness of their truth and falsity. Uh, uh, perhaps statements. Uh, Indicative if then statements and the like of all these creedal have only uh, their deflationary truth, whereas probability claims understood as normative claims have full deflationary truth, even though the analysis I'm giving uh, is expressivistic because it involves warrant and I give expressivistic analysis of uh, claims of warrant. Um, so moral claims, on, even on Ayer's proving most of its view, uh, uh, come out on the uh, full deflationary truth side here. So, uh, in, I came up with the claim I made in 1990 that moral statements are neither true nor false in an, in an important sense. Uh, that was my claim in Wise Choice and Feelings. I gave it up in Thinking Out Live, but that became agnostic on uh, whether there's such a thing as the robust truth that goes beyond what an expressivist accords to uh, normative statements. Uh, but I continue to claim that, it, that epistemic conditionals are neither true nor false in a sense in which uh, uh, normative claims are true or false. Uh, they epistemic conditionals and the like uh, do have bare deflationary truth, I admit, uh, but they don't in general have full deflationary truth. So these are the, the agreement conditions for if you're in a, in a United States. So, right. 
Right. How do I extend those to agreement conditions when I'm not in the same okay. side of the state? Well, when, so. when I'm using term agreement conditions here, I, okay. I'm not talking about the, uh, maybe, maybe this isn't the ideal terminology, but I'm not talking about the conditions under which I uh, uh, agree that uh, perhaps it rain or something like that. I'm talking about the uh, agreement conditions in a way that uh, we can make correspond to truth conditions by, uh, by making the, uh, the conditions under which one is, uh, uh, if one, the conditions of uh, decided, uh, uh, state, the decided states of mind uh, that would constitute the agreement uh, and complement the state, state is the set of decided states of mind that constitute the state. Okay, so, so, so yes, point? I'm saying uh, when you agree, uh, uh, perhaps it rains, uh, you're, uh, uh, you're, you're agreeing, but not in the sense that, that I'm talking about when I talk about agreement. <laughs> okay, so, but, uh, so once I have these uh, agreement conditions, that's uh, expressed in terms of the uh, maximally decided state, is there a nice way to go from those to agreement conditions when I'm not in the maximally decided state? Um, uh, well, I, you're, I think of you're not being in a maximally decided state as, um, as having uh, degrees of credence in all the, in each of the maximally decided states. And, um, of course, if there, um, there are going to be too many uh, maximally decided states for, to think of that as a state of having um, some such credence uh, separately for each one. But, uh, but one's uh, epistemic state and then taking it in, in um, a highly idealized case uh, gives a credence measure over the um, fully decided states. And, and then having certain credence measures uh, involves uh, giving high probability of being conditional So your maximally decided states are what Savage would call a small world? Uh, yeah, we could run these either as uh, big worlds or small worlds. But, but, the, but they're the worlds. They're, yeah. they're, they have this. Well, they, yeah, well, I mean, when we talk about worlds, uh, we're, we're using a different mode of expression. So, um, so Stalin actually talks about uh, possible worlds as maximally specific ways right. things might have been. I'm taking it as sort of understood uh, massively specific ways things might have been uh, naturalistically, including psychologically. I'm not taking it as understood uh, what a massively specific way things might have been normatively is. Um, um, and then um, and then we uh, say, well, we uh, just as we can talk it differently um, uh, about uh, Belief in um, um, a maximally specific way things might have been, and um, and agreement with the claim that things are that way. Um, so, in cases where um, the claim that things are that way is um, considerably problematic, we can start out by talking about. Being in a maximally decided state of mind, um, and so about agreement conditions in this uh, restricted sense of uh, maximally decided states that would constitute agreeing and would constitute disagreeing, um, and then um, um, and then that allows us to um, talk as if there are maximally specific. Ways things might have been normatively. Right. Um, so what about? The well, I, I uh, well, to a first approximation, I think that those uh, 
our propositional in the sense of uh, having uh, full agreement conditions and, uh, and uh, then to a second approximation I take what I seem to remember of uh, something you suggested to me 25 years ago that, uh, that uh, maybe those two have uh, sort of degrees of acceptability that the basic subjective conditional uh, involves uh, uh, chance and length uh, is a chancy uh, subjective conditional the chance of the, um, of the atom uh, uh, of the Geiger counter clicking if it were put in that position uh, uh, would be such and such so that we might be expressing the Expectation of that uh, chancy conditional, but to a first approximation for most cases, uh, the subjective conditionals. I think, well, first, I, my view is that subjective conditionals act uh, quite differently from epistemic conditionals, and that they're uh, pretty well explained as uh, nearness conditionals in a Stallmacher Lewis sort of way. And uh, so I was talking here entirely about. Uh, Epistemic conditionals, and I think uh, for the most part, at any rate, uh, indicative conditionals are epistemic conditionals. Um, so, uh, so uh, on the conditionals, uh, a little more. Um, so, how uh, how uh, committed are you to the um, uh, to the idea that? Uh, uh, in every case, if one thinks that the uh, that the antecedent is false, then uh, one neither disagrees or agrees. Because I was thinking about like, the Stallmaker example. You know, Stallmaker's here. He's in disguise, uh -huh. right? And it seems to me, it seems to me that I ought to be able to agree to that, even if I'm it's quite sure he isn't here. Because after all, I sort of look around and uh -huh. you know I can eliminate every possibility of him being. You know, of the undisguised I still maker being here. Um, and so, so I, I, I mean, I'm sure that there are sort of lots of cases where we want to say exactly what you say, but I'm just interested whether or not you might be willing to sort of allow cases where... Well, I mean, there, there's a different kind of case where, of course, I allow, namely, <coughs> indicative conditionals with true antecedents. Um, and, um, well, I could pretty well allow it for indicative conditionals where the antecedent that tails the consequent of uh, the specific that specific example uh, you have to have a pretty far-fetched case but uh, if uh, somebody who uh, hadn't seen Stone Acker but was sufficiently sure that he never disguises himself uh, uh, might uh, be more doubtful of uh, whether his perceptual apparatus and his face recognition apparatus was working that, uh, that, um, that, um, yeah. uh, that, that, uh, uh, Stone Acker isn't here undisguised. So I, I think you could give at least far-fetched cases there, somebody who agrees with us, uh, perfectly well about how things almost surely are, but, uh, um, but accepts an incompatible But but if I just so so one of the I mean I guess I take it that one of like, the functions of this kind of an indicative condition is to sort of express what kind of things we might have evidence for, right? So you know I might look around and say, if Don Laker's here, he's, he, he's in disguise. He isn't here, of course, but you know, and what I, and it, it seems not unreasonable to, to to agree to that on the ground that what I kind of said is, look, you know. If he's here, none of us have any evidence for it. Um, and that's sort of what the function of the uh, conditional is there. Yeah, yes, and uh, but doesn't that follow from the Ramsey Adams sort of analysis? So uh, we know that uh, you um, you would give uh, uh, any noticeable credence at all to Stonehanger's being here disguise. Um, so 
uh, you would only, so you're expressing mm -hmm. I, I, of course, I'm making a rhetorical flourish, but let's not really yeah, take it straightforwardly. You're expressing a high conditional credence that all matters being uh, yeah. in disguise on this being here, uh, given that you have uh, virtually yeah, yeah. individual credence on this being here in disguise, then uh, we infer that you believe he's not here. Uh, yeah, um, it seemed like uh, your view would uh, only be nicer if you didn't have to restrict to the uh, extremal uh, states in your agreement conditions. So I was wondering what the, what you take the motivation for the restriction to be. Is it the lottery paradox, and would you be happy to have uh, a rule for assertability that wasn't subject to it? Uh, I've, uh never been a great uh, fan of uh, the lottery paradox that's showing us anything on which I think uh, belief is uh, credence uh, uh, not uh, significantly different from one um, uh, for the matter at hand and uh, that uh, uh, and I don't care much if uh, setting up the lottery paradox uh, requires you just to keep uh, changing the matter of the matter of hand or whether you're uh, belief in that sense and uh, and uh, a large number of things uh, uh, doesn't rationally require uh, belief in their conjunction this CP uh, has a discussion of this and, uh, uh, not in those terms but uh, but I I remember being a bit of a fan of uh, Hume's discussion. Uh, I, I guess I think in a lottery case you have uh, high credence and uh, each ticket didn't win uh, 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 zero, or close to zero credence that no ticket won and, uh, and there's nothing paradoxical about that and uh, that's what you say about uh, in terms of the word uh, belief uh, with no qualification doesn't much matter. I see then, what's the motive for restricting the states to the extremal ones? Like restricting? In the agreement condition, why, 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 oh, why, I, why I'm just saying that there's an important contrast here to be drawn between um, um, belief that lets you speak of truth conditions in a deflationary sense and, uh, and agreement that, uh, uh, Certainly, we call it an agreement, and that's perfectly okay. Uh, and I take it that's the same notion as I'm taking as primitive in the other case, but uh, uh, agreement uh, of a kind that, or agreement in a context where uh, you can't get uh, virtual truth conditions out of it. Uh, so, what, what I'm trying to explain is uh, the sense in which you can be an emotivist and believe in a kind of truth for uh, for moral statements like stealing is wrong um, uh, but still not believe in truth in the same sense for uh, an addictive conditional or perhaps statement. Does that make sense? I guess I still don't see why you couldn't have done the same thing with not extremal states. Um, well, because the, the question is, um, um, uh, there, there are ways the world might, well, the example, there are ways the world might be with respect to whether it uh, rained last night, and whether it snowed last night. And uh, so, um, as, as long as we can say uh, what it is to, uh, agree with the disjunction uh, given each of those um, states that one might be in, uh, we, can, we can speak of the um, truth conditions for it rained or it snowed, uh, whereas, um, so just as I agree with it, if it uh, uh, in case I 
believe that it rained and disbelieve that it snowed. Um, also, I can say it's true in case it rained but didn't snow. Um, whereas, I can't do that with the gravity like, atoms, you know, it's right. Uh, and, um, indicative of traditional in general, and I can't do that with the perhaps statement. I can't say, well, here are the, um, here are the virtual truth conditions for the perhaps statement. I could say it's true if perhaps it rained, but that's, uh, um, but, uh, that's not the same as getting a set of uh, uh, mass specific ways things might have been with respect to rain and snow, um, such that if things have been that way, um, it would have rained or snow. I think what Kevin was not asking is similar to what I'm asking. I'm still not quite sure what the answer is. So if Kevin says it rained or it snowed last night, and neither one of us is in fact really a pink state, what are the agreement conditions for that? What, 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 what conditions do I have to satisfy in order to be, be in agreement with that? Um, well, there it's not good. Um, um, there's not much to say. Um, 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 well, you agree with it if you um, if you um, um, don't uh, reject the possibility that it be the rain or snow and you allow. The other possibilities, um, and that's that's about all there is to say there. Okay, so I so no, hard to but, agree with his, but, his so he's, he he says it rained or it snowed, and for me to agree with that, he is to um, hold perhaps it snowed or perhaps it rained or both. Yeah. So one one thing you could say is that uh, to agree with that is to be state in such that uh, any state you could, any maximally decided state you could move to without changing your mind about it, that would be a maximally decided state in which you um, believe that it created snow. Well, 